Hi everyone. Welcome to the session, The Private Sector, Water and Climate Resilience in Uncertain Times, Collective Action. I'm Neha Madana Sthana, representing IKEA as co-convener of the session. As we are all aware, collective action is a key component of water stewardship. Water-related collective action can be challenging and time-intensive, but there are lessons to be learned from work in river basins around the world on how to create successful, inclusive, and impactful collective action initiatives. By leveraging multiple stakeholders from different sectors and skill sets, collective action projects can have greater positive water impact than one company or one entity acting alone. Today, we have the opportunity to listen from our speakers, both from the NGO perspective and the corporate perspective. They'll be sharing their experience, engaging in water-related collective action through examples and share key successes, challenges, and lessons learned from those efforts. Second part of the session today will be a panel discussion where you will have the opportunity to interact with the panelists representing industry who will be answering to your questions. I would like to encourage you participants to ask your questions throughout the session through the chat function on Pathical. We will address these questions during dedicated time for Q&A at the end. Anything we don't answer during the session, speakers can come back with the answers post-session. I'm really delighted to introduce our guest speakers of the day. We have three of them. Our first speaker for today are Barry Liner from Water Environment Federation and Scott Eccles representing ZBHC. Barry is the Chief Technical Officer of the Water Environment Federation, responsible for leading innovation and resource recovery initiatives globally. He is facilitator for the Unleash SDG Innovation Lab. He has worked with water stakeholders in government, utilities, private industry, academia, and international agencies in over a dozen countries over the past 30 years. Scott is Senior Director for the ZBHC Roadmap to Zero program coordinating all focus areas and driving program delivery. Scott is an expert in environmental analytical chemistry and textile chemistry with over 30 years of experience. Next speaker for today is Cora Kemyar from Pacific Institute. Cora is a senior researcher at the Pacific Institute where she works on corporate water stewardship, integrated water management, California water policy and more. Much of her work supports the CU Water Mandate and the California Water Action Collaborative. After hearing presentations from Barry, Scott, and Cora, we will turn it over to Tom Williams, Director of Water for WBCSD, to introduce our panel speaker and moderate that discussion. I'm here to get out of the way as quickly as possible, and your job is to listen, enjoy, and put questions in the chat. Over to you, Scott. Uh, thank you very much, Nia, for that uh, introduction, and, and thanks to World Water Week for inviting us to, to give our perspective, um, because we, the title of this session is around collective action, and I think we all know that some challenges are really just too big um, for any one company to take on alone. And um, about 10 years ago, almost exactly 10 years ago now, there was the uh, Greenpeace Detox campaign, which pointed out the very difficult challenge of managing chemicals in a, in a broad global supply chain and how that can impact the people and the environments around where the production is occurring, but also the consumers and the end products through the chemicals that, that might be used. And early on, the brands realized that we had to do this together. We had to collaborate together. We had to do it in a transparent way. And everyone had to make a, a commitment to, to address this challenge. And so what came out of that challenge, if we go to the next slide, was the ZDHC um, collaboration. And it started as six brands in 2011, and it's grown to over 160 stakeholders throughout the um, textile and footwear supply chains. And it includes the brands, uh, retailers, the chemical industry, the producers, the people that are actually making the products, a lot of the solution providers, and a lot of our, 
our partner um, groups that are also working on these initiatives. And in 2015, it became a foundation. We've grown to over um, 40 people within the foundation itself, but the real work of the foundation is through how our contributors help and help shape the guidelines that we're producing. If you go on to the next slide, we really take a holistic approach to the management of chemicals in the supply chain and how to improve um, the and use better chemistry in the supply chain. We look at the inputs, we, so we look at the chemicals that are used. We have a manufacturing restricted substances list that prevents those chemicals from ever being used in the first place. We look at the processes that go on and how the chemicals are used in the facilities, how they're stored in the facilities, but also, and, and most relevant to, to this um, session is, we look at the outputs. So we look at the wastewater and we've created the first overall wastewater guidelines for the industry that include not only the conventional parameters that you think of such as color and, and pH and the oxygen demand, but also looking at those chemicals that are banned from use and are those occurring in the wastewater. And we really feel that's important to verify what's happening upstream to, to find out whether these chemicals are being phased out. So we've created a holistic approach around wastewater as well. We have a sampling plan and how to take same wastewater. We have wastewater guidelines, which really raise the bar and try to challenge people to move from a foundational level of just kind of compliance, which still goes beyond legal compliance, but to progressive and aspirational levels of um, water treatment. We have water treatment technologies guidance, which helps people understand what technologies might help improve their processes. We also have a data reporting system because one of the challenges is that brands and retailers may all be asking different things of the facilities that are making the products. And what we want to do is align that so that everybody's asking the same question, everybody's asking for the same information on wastewater, and not only that, be able to share it. So if I'm a facility taking a wastewater sample, I can now take that wastewater sample, upload the results to what we call our wastewater module on our gateway, and then that can be shared among the brands so that they only have to do the sampling once and they can share it. They can create a report called the Clearstream Report, which is a report card on their wastewater that they can share with the brands that they're working with. And that's great to a point, but that only gets us to the point where we know what's going on. We really wanna work on improvements. And if we go to the next slide, one of the clear things we saw that needed improvement and that needs information is getting, making sure that the wastewater treatment system operators have some minimum qualifications in this industry. So we created a wastewater treatment system qualification guidelines that we will be using to help train facilities, but also um, brands and retailers can use that to assess whether the facilities that they're working with have trained operators. Now, it's great to come up with all of this guidance and, and roll it out, but it really, again, is the implementation. And a guidance is no good and the qualifications list is no good unless there is a way to then get that information to the people that need it and actually provide them with the training. Now, ZDHC is great at collaboration. We're great at bringing people together, but we're not the experts in training people for how to treat wastewater. And this, this problem has been apparent for many, many years. And, and here's a, a favorite article that uh, some of our contributors have seen all the way back to the, the 1950s. Um, but we wanna work with and collaborate with folks like um, WEF to help us implement this training because they have the tools that can actually enable people to meet the guidelines for qualifications that we've set out there. And I'll let Barry um, tell you a little bit more about this intersection of how we've created some guidelines, but they really have some tools that enable people to pick those guidelines up and um, implement them. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, yes, yeah, so in that, uh, in that previous slide, you may have noticed that <clears throat> the there was a quote in there that said the technology of water treatment has advanced to keep pace with the exacting demands of dyers only to fail in many cases at its point of application. And, and that's from actually 1957. So the, the, the need for capacity building has been recognized for, for many years. And the other piece of this is 
when the focus was on um, the dyes or the special chemicals, um, you know, a lot of that got under control, but some of the basic wastewater treatment and management processes were actually where we really needed to focus on um, in, in the uh, in capacity development. So about a couple of years ago, uh, ZDHC and the Water Environment Federation um, started working together to uh, take the existing training that the Water Environment Federation has on uh, wastewater treatment um, and, and then look to see how we can roll that out throughout the uh, textile supply chain. And um, we have, so we focused on a couple of areas um, and the, the mater training materials were already available in English and then uh, were translated into Spanish as well. Looking at where the, the manufacturing is in the supply chain, um, we worked with ZDHC members to create, uh, to translate that into Mandarin and Vietnamese. So as a starting point to start making sure that we can roll this out is through part of a longer term uh, program, which you'll see on the next slide as we move forward to that. So about Nike, uh, one of the ZDHC members funded the translation into Mandarin and Vietnamese of the, of the training materials, which was step one. And we've started rolling that out throughout CDHC and, um, and the, the, member, um, the member companies of, uh, of ZDHC. The next stage that we'll be working on uh, in partnership is training delivery, um, both in person and online. Uh, and we're in the phase of rolling that out right now. And then um, a, the next, the, as part of that, we're moving into a credentialing um, program where ZDHC uh, is, is evaluating, um, creating a certificate um, to basically uh, enhance the, the profile and professionalism of skilled operators worldwide in the textile supply chain. Um, and so this is part of the, the plan, a uh, great opportunity for collaboration between brands, between industry and, um, and nonprofits and, uh, and working globally to address some of these problems. Um, and this has already been, this approach, while even while we're still in the middle of it, has already been identified uh, as a potential pathway for other industries, including the, the pharmaceutical industry, um, that we are in early stages of, of discussing similar kind of approaches. So I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to share this uh, um, story of partnership. And I look forward to seeing, um, hearing from the rest of the participants on their journeys. Thank you. Thanks, Barry and Scott, for those presentations. Hi, everyone. My name is Cora. I'm with the Pacific Institute. For those not familiar with the Pacific Institute, we are a California-based nonprofit organization. And since 1987, we have worked with everyone from Fortune 500 companies to disenfranchised communities to create and advance solutions to the world's most pressing water challenges. Since 2007, we have acted as co-secretariat of the UN Global Compact CEO Water Mandate which is a global commitment platform for corporate water stewardship with 200 endorsing companies. Today, I'm going to talk about an example of water stewardship collective action here in California. Next slide. So as some background, California has always experienced periods of drought and water scarcity as a semi-arid region, and California's water systems over the past century have become highly engineered and human influenced. I think that settlers of California always dreamed it to be a wetter place than it really was and built massive infrastructure projects to get water supplies needed to support huge population and economic growth. And today, California's water system supports a population of 40 million residents and almost 10 million acres of irrigated agriculture. Next slide. As you may have seen in the news, California is again in a severe drought along with most of the Western United States. 
with climate change driving higher temperatures, melting snowpacks, and more erratic precipitation patterns, we're seeing increased water extremes from historic drought to historic flood and back again, which presents new and serious challenges for California water managers. On top of that, we face compounding challenges of freshwater ecosystem decline, wildfire risk, sea level rise, and more. Next slide. In 2014, an unlikely coalition of NGOs and corporations came together to address these challenges as the California Water Action Collaborative, which we call QUAC. The idea for QUAC was born out of a CEO water mandate meeting in Los Angeles at the height of California's last big drought. Several attendees of that meeting from multinational food and beverage companies to leading environmental organizations express a desire to better understand California's water challenges, identify geographies and issues of shared interest, and collaborate to make a positive impact on water security in the state. Next slide. Calif Quack began as a casual working group and now five years later has evolved into a formal network of over 28 organizations who are learning from experts and one another and partnering together for collective impact on innovative solutions and to improve water resilience across yeah. Quac members collaborate on joint stewardship projects. They set shared goals. We have monthly group calls and biannual in-person meetings. When we could meet in person, we would explore a different California watershed during those twice yearly meetings, as you can see in the photo here up in Northern California. Next slide. Over time, Quack's approach to collective action has matured from more opportunistic to more strategic. We have three regional working groups in the urban San Francisco Bay Area and South Coast and the agricultural Central Valley. This funnel diagram on the slide helps guide our project selection process. We start with the key water challenges we want to address in a given region, consider other benefits of interest, account for the logistical and financial factors influencing project implementation, pick preferred implementation categories and principles, and then pursue opportunities that align with those parameters. Next slide. So now Quack has a portfolio of about a dozen collective action projects across the state from headwaters to farms to cities. And you can see some examples of those types of projects listed here on the slide. In addition to implementing these collective action projects, we track the outcomes of this work against six related goals seen here on the colorful boxes on the screen. And these are aligned with Sustainable Development Goal 6 on water. It's exciting and powerful to see the cumulative impact of these combined efforts over the years. In closing, here are four takeaways that I've gotten from participating in Quack over the years. First is that companies can work together in a pre-competitive environment to have positive water impacts. Second is that although collective action can be more difficult and complex than individual companies working independently, it can also produce more impacts and better outcomes. Third, it's critical to understand the local water and watershed context and prioritize water challenges to address before developing and investing in collective action projects. And fourth and last, having standardized goals and metrics can help a collective group like this direct its efforts in a common direction. Thank you all for listening. And I will now pass the virtual mic to my colleague, Tom Williams, Water Director for WBCSD. Great, thank you, Cora, and thank you also to Barry and Scott. If you have any questions for uh, Cora, Barry and Scott, please do post them uh, in the chat section on the Pathable platform. Don't try and post them uh, here on Zoom. Go to Pathable platform, find the chat uh, box and, and put your question in there. And I'll uh, take them up uh, as part of this panel discussion. Um, we have two panel speakers for you now to dig into some more aspects of collective action. We have Nima from PepsiCo and Miguel from Orbia. I will let them introduce themselves and their companies uh, in a moment. Uh, like with many World War Week sessions, we want to make this 
as interactive as possible. So please do post your questions on Pathable and uh, I'll pick them up. We've got about 30 minutes or so for this panel discussion and we'll bring in uh, Barry Scott and Cora uh, a little bit later on as well. Okay, let's kick off with some uh, intros and start with uh, Nima. Um, so Nima, please um, introduce yourself, uh, your company and uh, a high level overview of, of the relationship of water with your company. Yes, thank you, Tom. Um, good day, everyone, given the different time zones. Um, so I'm Nima Dancera and I work for PepsiCo um, on the Frito-Lay side of our business, which is our snack side of our business. And I'm located in Plano, Texas. And I've um, been with the company a little over um, two and a half years. And um, I lead our water program for um, North America on the Frito-Lay side of the business. So focused mainly on um, plant water ops efficiency. So reducing water in our manufacturing facilities and also water stewardship. So external collaboration and making sure that we're driving our water stewardship agenda externally, right? So um, for those of you who are not familiar with PepsiCo, we are among um, the largest food and beverage company um, in the world, right? So we manufacture brands like um, Pepsi, Gatorade, Tropicana, and also from on the snack side, um, like Lay's, Dorito, um, Quaker Oats, just to name a few, right? So um, as a food and beverage company for us, water is a key component of our operations, right? Starting from the start, from agriculture, the raw materials that we use to make, making our products, to manufacturing, and even to the delivery part of our business. So because of that, we, we know that um, we have to play a part in making sure that we are mitigating water challenges in the local communities where we operate, right? So it's a very um, key uh, business imperative, and it's important for us to um, conserve that natural resource. So um, with that, um, I think I'm going to hand it over to Miguel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Miguel Arenas. Uh, I am leading the, the challenge for sustainability and hs &E in Norbia Group. My specific responsibility in the, is in the chemical business, when water is really important topic for, for, for all groups. So right now I am in Santiago, Chile, but you know, that is changing in, in the time. So maybe soon I will be in, in, in other part of the world. Great, Nima and Miguel, great to have you with us on this panel discussion today. So Nima, um, starting with you, we, we've heard about sector-based and geography-based collective action uh, in those two presentations. So one from the textile sector and one focusing on California. I mean, what does collective action mean to you at PepsiCo? And can you give an example where you have seen collective action really move the needle on water stewardship? Uh, yes, definitely. So for us, uh, to begin with, we've we've been doing sustainability and water and reduction in, in our manufacturing facilities for a very long time, and even in our um, supply chain, right? So um, over time, given the water challenges, especially in um, areas that we call high water risk. So um, PepsiCo, every three years, we do an analysis that um, looks at water risk in um, where we operate, right, in all of our manufacturing facilities globally. And based on that, we have identified over 100 of our facilities located in what we call high water stress areas. And we realized that just focusing on our operation it's not going to move the needle, right? Because um, at the end of the day for us, um, making sure that we're mitigating those water challenges is um, important for business continuity, right? And water, um, we've had many times that water challenges are local. And because of that, we've realized that it's very important to um, work in that external space and pre-competitive environment, meaning working with other food and beverage companies, other industries and um, environmental groups to make sure that we're coming together to um, understand what the water challenges are, where we are, and then understand what our part is in contributing to those challenges and what we can do um, to mitigate those challenges as well, right? So a very good example is um, in Quark, right, in California. So because I'm in North America and I sit in Frito-Lay, so in North America, we have become, I mean, we, we are part of the Quark, the California Water Action Collaborative, and through 
Quark, we've been able to understand a, a lot um, of the water challenges in California, right? And then understand the complexity of water supply in California, as um, most of you know. And um, from that, we've also built meaningful relationships, both with um, other companies and environmental groups and have participated in very impactful um, water projects in, in that, in those geographies, right? And for us, um, collective action, this is where it it's becomes really in, um, geographical, right? So even though I'm on Frito-Lay, but when we started looking at collective action, for all of our different business units that are within that geography, we come together and work with other companies externally, right? So a very um, good example of a project is um, we partnered with um, Abu Dhabi Foundation in California through um, the Quark organization. That's where we met in um, Abu Dhabi Foundation and um, partnered in, um, sport, um, invested in a project, um, which uh, basically is called the California Wildfire um, Restoration, where we um, invested in planting trees um, in that um, San Joaquin Valley area. And um, based on our investment, um, we are basically um, looking forward to um, replenishing over 400 million gallons of water in that watershed. So, and that that is included many other um, opportunities that we've, we've partnered with um, with other um, companies in that in that geographies and also many um, globally. Great, thanks, Nima. And you mentioned um, you know, pre-competitive uh, engagement, which is something that Cora mentioned, and one of the I guess best um, descriptions of what this means, because maybe not everybody on the on, on the webinar is conversant with this kind of language, is you know, pre-competitive engagement is about working across um, shared value chains to raise the floor, standards, norms, and behaviors, whereas competition is about raising the ceiling through competitive advantage. So I think that's a nice way to illustrate the difference between pre-competitive engagement and, and competitive engagement. Um, so okay. thanks, Nima. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to you. Um, now, Miguel, um, now, a lot of the key drivers we see for collective action on water is, is focused on quantity. However, quality is important. And we heard this with the ZDHC presentation, for example. What are some of the examples of collection, collective action around industrial wastewater that you have been involved in? Um, yeah, right, right now in Orbia, in a specific in the, in the chemical business, we would like to don't use uh, new water. That is that is the that is the focus. So we have different examples in in Latin America and North America that try to create some synergy or symbiosis with other company or with the city with the city. If we are close to the city, for example, that is no it's it's really common in some site. You know, some some chemical plant are are to some area and after the city is is, is coming. So we are working with the city, for example, in, in Mexico for, for use the black water of the city for putting the in our process. So when back the water is better than when we receive the water. So I think so is 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 really is really good example because in the past we, we are using only the material like clean water um, or only one use water. And but, but right now we are trying to we are trying to do the opposite of that and, and the, the synergy that we are working with the city. And let me tell you with other companies too, because we are not alone in this challenge. It is really important in the, maybe in the last five years. Great, thanks Miguel. And I think this collaboration between industry and local authorities is such a untapped opportunity, particularly when we think of industrial wastewater, reuse potential, um, you know, sharing services and infrastructure with municipalities. We heard about the partnerships you can create for knowledge transfer between industry and um, municipal operators in the ZDHC uh, presentation. But I think there's a whole spectrum of collaboration activities between industry and local authorities on, on these kinds of things that we could be tapping into. Um, Nima, back, back to you, and, and same question to you, Miguel, after Nima. Now, if you were advising a company that hadn't previously embarked on collective action, they were unsure of how to get started, they were a little bit uncertain of what the outcomes would be around water stewardship, what would you tell them to get them started? What would your advice be in terms of getting started on collective action? 
Yeah, good question. So um, I always go back to the saying, um, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together, right? So to me, um, that's what collective action is, right? So if you really want to move the needle, you have to work with um, all the relevant stakeholders where you operate, right? Because as I said, water is a local challenge, right? And uh, we've seen that in many places globally, right? So um, for us, PepsiCo, when, for example, I think this might be a good approach for others to consider if they're thinking about doing collective action, or even water stewardship in general, right? When we um, expanded our water goals externally, right, we decided to adopt the Alliance for Water Stewardship Standard. So I don't know um, if um, a lot of people are familiar with that, but it's really a global um, framework that um, provides um, a, a guideline on how to go about water stewardship, right? So there is um, a very detailed um, um, requirement, what they call criteria or indicators within that standard that um, basically tells you what you need to do um, to engage stakeholders externally and um, how to go about water stewardship. So I really think that's a good way to, um, to start if, if you're really um, trying to figure out how to go about doing collective action. So it's a really a framework that can give you that guidance. Yeah, fantastic, Niamh. Yeah. And I think the AWS standard is, is sort of the first go-to framework that uh, companies yes. should look at. And there's a whole range of other tools and frameworks. Companies have, have been on this um, journey for a number of years now, so don't be afraid to-, to Definitely. And, and frameworks. Great, Miguel, over to you. If you were advising a, a company that was really wanting to uh, get engaged in collective action, what advice would you give? Uh, yeah, yeah, similar, similar, um that we are talking with Nina. I think so that the, the, um, that the key of the challenge is working together with the, with the stakeholder, with the community. Uh, we are in some part when the water is no arriving to all people, for example. So, so we are the limited uh, like a double, double challenge, like the production because it's, it's necessary for, for our process. Try to don't use the water, but share the water too is other challenge. So this, the, in this line, they're working together for, for find solutions for, for all the committee is, is for me, is the, is the vision in the final. That, that will, for the reason we are doing that, we are, we are doing right now. Uh, but yeah, I see, so that, that for me is the, is the key. Great, and uh, if any of the audience have questions for Nima and Miguel, do post them uh, in the Pathable chat. I'm gonna invite uh, Barry and Cora uh, to join the panelists, because I see there's a few questions coming through on Pathable uh, based on their presentation. So I'm gonna first start with some questions coming in for Quack, Cora, with you, and then I'll move on to um, Scott and Barry on ZDHC. So a couple of questions maybe to take together, Cora, on Quack. First from Sarah. Um, the, the sort of governments, governance arrangement you have for Quack, if you could just um, describe that. And then the second question from Colin, um, what is the engagement with government um, in Quack? And does the initiative have a sustainable business model beyond the support of the companies involved? Yes, happy to answer those. So to the first question around governance, uh, Quack is facilitated by a neutral NGO party that helps uh, you know, coordinate meetings and do some of the practical logistical facilitation, but also help guide the, the discussion um, in the direction of Quack. And then there is a six person steering committee um, that is really the decision-making body of Quack. And that is made up of uh, three NGO Quack members and three corporate members. And there are you know, terms for that steering committee and people rotate on and off of them. So that's the primary mechanism for governance. And then decisions to uh, bring new Quack members into the fold is um, open to all members. All members have say in bringing additional members into the group. Uh, in terms of the, the second question around government involvement um, and the Quack business model, perhaps I'll answer the business model question first because I, it does relate to this governance model. Um, so all Quack members, uh, contribute financially to uh, be able to support the facilitation services, um, to host meetings, um, to do all of the, um, you know, the practical pieces of, of hosting a collaborative. And then in terms of project investments, 
um, most, if not all, Quack projects are, are co-funded. So it's not just corporate contributions, but also contributions from other sectors, um, including state and local and national governments. Uh, and then that leads me to the next piece of that question, which is government involvement. So governments cannot be members of Quack, but we do have a, a few um, allies, we call them. So for example, the United States Forest Service is an ally of Quack, and we work with them on uh, forest restoration and mountain meadow restoration projects. They've been a really great partner. Uh, and then we also frequently have guest speakers attend quack meetings to have a discussion to present on um, topical issues and that has included um, the California Department of Water Resources, the California Natural Resource Agency. Um, so there is involvement and engagement with government, but they're not quack members. Great, thanks for that, Cora. And maybe I could um, leave you with a question to think about um, whilst I go to Scott Cora. That is around the replicability of what you've been doing through Quack. So if there was somebody on the line today, which was in a completely different geography, somewhere in Asia, Africa, for example, which had some maybe similar problems, maybe some different challenges, um, what would you say from the Quack framework is replicable um, for other geographies? Any key learnings that you, any geography could take on board? Um, be interesting to get your insight on that in a moment. But first, um, Let's go to Scott. And there was a question from Sophie. Scott, I see you answered it on um, Pathable, but for the benefit of those who maybe are not on there, you could uh, just come online and respond to it. So the question was, how do you deal with emerging substances such as nanomaterials, um, for example, for which there is no regulation yet? So Scott, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, thanks. That's a that's a really good question, and it's it's um, one that the the textile and footwear industry has has been challenged with because if you think about uh, most of the regulations are on final products, and there's a wide variation in the the global regulations that are out there around chemicals, and so early on we recognized where we really needed to to stop the chemical use is at the manufacturing stage to keep the chemicals out of the facilities to begin with. And so our manufacturing restricted substances list was created to do that. Um, but it was designed to be a, a living document, um, recognizing that people are finding out information all the time about different chemicals. And you mentioned nanomaterials. Um, and so the manufacturing restricted substances list has a component that we've built a submission platform where anyone um, can submit suggestions for compounds that should be added to the MRSL and they submit that with information about the hazard, um, the usage patterns that they're aware of, um, alternatives, safer alternatives that might be available. And then that information goes to what we call our MRSL advisory council. So it's an independent group of experts that reviews that information and then makes a recommendation back to ZDHC as to whether we should add that um, compound to our MRSL. So in that way, the MRSL stays up to date. Um, obviously, if there's anything with regard to regulations on chemicals, we address that. We can address that in a, in a fast manner. Um, but we really built the document to be um, able to be updated and, and go through this regular process to make sure that it stays up to date. Super, Scott. Thank you for that. Um, and before I go back to Cora, I just want to pick up one question here from Sophie, which was talking about any concrete examples of building a decentralized water treatment plant by a few companies in a specific geographical area, partly financed by the corporates themselves. There are some good examples. There's one in, in Durban um, where a number of uh, private companies have come together to reuse uh, industrial wastewater. And one example I use quite often is actually in Sao Paulo. It's a project called um, Aquapolo. I think at the time it was the largest water reuse facility in, in uh, South America. It was co-financed by Sabesh, which many will know is the public utility um, in Sao Paulo, and Braskem, which is a, the industrial partner uh, in Sao Paulo. And effectively, it um, provided um, industry, including Braskem and others, um, with reused um, municipal water. A key factor for me in terms of what made that successful was that Braskem signed a 41-year um, contract 
with the reuse facility that they would actually um, pay and receive uh, water, reuse water for 41 years. And I think that kind of long term commitment is super important to um, sort of underline the financial viability uh, of such projects. So that's just a couple I have on front of mind from Durban and Sao Paulo. I'll try and pop a couple of links um, in the chat so you can read more about those and encourage anybody else on the panel to come forward if they have uh, other good examples. Um, Cora, I wanna come back to you uh, both on the question that I asked, and there's another one has come in uh, since we last spoke, which is about how projects are prioritized within Quack and, and who we oversees them. So um, a little bit on the re replicability of the Quack model and then on the project selection and oversight. Sure, happy to speak to that. And it looked like maybe Miguel had something to say about the centralized wastewater treatment. So perhaps we can come back to him on that. But um, in terms of replicability, this is certainly something that we've been thinking about now that you know Quack is five years old and what are the opportunities to scale up or replicate this model. I do think that a lot of components are, are quite replicable in terms of the, uh, the governance structure and the collaboration structure. Uh, and then the metrics that we're using to track progress, as I mentioned in my presentation, are, are quite aligned with Sustainable Development Goal 6. And I don't think that they are um, you know, particularly specific to California. Of course, which of the metrics are, are most important will depend on what region you're in, but I think that that metrics framework is also replicable. And we are beginning to see um, some of the uh, pieces of Quack get replicated in other parts of the country, at least. For example, there was just recently launched a Texas Water Action Collaborative. Um, and I think that is an example of trying to take some of those successful pieces of Quack and replicate them in a different state within the United States. And then within California, there is increasing interest in the Colorado River Basin, which is an important source watershed for California, but of course is a distinct region with its own uh, water challenges and water governance issues. And I could also see the Quack model start to scale and replicate uh, more broadly within the Colorado River Basin as well. And beyond the United States, you know, there are a lot of great uh, collective action projects um, and collaboratives around the world um, that certainly Quack could probably learn from. And I think some of the components that have been successful in Quack could be replicated there as well. And then to the question about projects, this is a great question. And I think it's important to understand that Quack when it comes to actual project implementation is, is pretty decentralized. And so it's the individual implementing NGOs who are overseeing the project, there's no uh, project governance within Quack. It's more about governance of the collaborative and then projects are done individually with on the ground partners. Of course, many of these implementing partners are Quack members, um, but there's no you know, oversight of those individual projects at the collaborative level. Great, thanks you, Cora. And Miguel, did you wanna come back in on um, those examples of wastewater treatment? We have the different example, honestly. Uh, you, yeah, I remember where you come in, in with Braskem, and we have some we have some opportunity in Cartagena, in Colombia. You know, the chemical park there uh, create the synergy between company because that maybe that is the that is the the opportunity in the chemicals in general uh, around I think so around the world. Chemical park are not so extreme. So when we, when we talk about synergy with water, we can create many connections in the chemical park. So in this case, for example, we are, we are working with a um, concrete company uh, and another company that needs need different water quality, let me tell you like that. So we, we, we are creating a really good synergy and we, are, we, are, we have a, a planning reduction of 50%. So it's, it's really good project. And also, let me tell you other uh, great one is, is negative water for us in, in Mexico, in, in Guadalajara. It's a project with the city. So right now, one of our plan is, is water negative, let me tell you like that. So because we are using the, the, the black water of the city. So that is two examples for that. Great, thanks, Miguel. Um, more questions coming in. 
Cora, I'll come to you in a second on this question around the alignment of the work you're doing with subnational or, or national reporting, just to see if that's anything uh, is on your radar in that regard. But I just want to address this question from Sanjeev and see if anybody wants to come in from the panel on this. Um, so some organizations and coalitions are doing good work, but overall the industry still has a very long way to go on wastewater treatment. What is the biggest barrier to accelerating progress and making industry part of the solution on water quality? So I'll leave this question there and maybe one of the panelists wants to come back to that. But Cora, I'll come over to you and on this question of alignment with subnational or national reporting on SDG 6. Yeah, thanks, Tom. It's a great question and something that has been on my radar personally. It's not something that we've been able to accomplish yet. We did um, a few years ago have a conversation with the California Department of Water Resources when they were um, developing some of their water planning materials and looking at metrics to track progress. And um, in an ideal world, it would be great if that aligned better with SDG 6 or directly. It's not, you know, they all conceptually align, but to be able to actually connect that to the reporting mechanisms, I think, is the goal. And um, this uh, ability to kind of roll up, you know, from the ground up to the national level, I think, would be amazing. We're not there yet, uh, but I think this is partly why we wanted to make sure that the metrics did align so that once that opportunity arises, it's um, we're able to hopefully plug those in relatively easily, but we're not quite there yet. Great, thanks, Cora. Um, so coming back to this um, industry action on wastewater, um, and before I ask the panelists to um, to step in if they've got uh, some insights, I mean, one of from my perspective, one of the key triggers, if you like, um, is around externalities. So if companies would start to internalize externalities caused by wastewater pollution, so this could be environmental, social economic externalities, I think that will be a strong incentive for industry action. Now, if you look at many jurisdictions and the penalties and fines that they have um, for non-compliance, unfortunately, many business see those relatively low costs as a cost of doing business. Um, they really aren't a deterrent for um, stopping no further polluting activities, for example. So I, I really do think a key trigger will be for um, internalizing externalities and putting all the policies and regulations in place to do that. And if there are strong policy government signals to do this, I think industry will respond. Um, but let me hand over to um, any of the panelists if they have anything further to add uh, on that point. Please just unmute and, and go away. Hey, yeah, thanks, Tom. One of the things I would say is, uh, following on your point, I think a lot of it comes down to the regulatory environment. Because I think what you're seeing with, for example, the ZDHC example is when is industry taking the lead in some areas that actually don't have the regulatory environment and have the, the, the teeth in that. So they're actually forcing the issue. So I think um, it's very difficult to identify one single biggest challenge. But I do think, uh, you know, the baseline regulatory environment and making it worth uh, making it important to address the wastewater is, is critical to drive that. Yeah, I just, I, I, I think I totally agree with, with those, those uh, sentiments. And, and one thing that we noticed and that's apparent in the textile industry that people may not be aware of is, is most textile suppliers don't just serve one brand or one retailer, they're serving multiple manufacturers and so critical to our industry was having people align on what the expectations are and the outcomes and sharing that information because, you know, you rewind 10 years ago and you would have five different brands going to the same supplier and asking for five slightly different approaches on um, what their expectations were for wastewater. And so uh, part of you know, what ZDHC has really tried to do is to simplify things for the suppliers so that they've got you know, one source of, of a standard and then they can take that to all their suppliers and, and getting the brands to stop asking for slightly different expectations from the suppliers and aligning it has been critical in our industry. Great, thank you, Barry and Scott. Um, one last question for the panelists um, to sort of muse on um, 
Scott, you just spoke about looking 10 years back. And I wonder if the panelists look 10 years forward um, and collective action has made a significant, meaningful contribution to attaining SDG 6. Where do we put our efforts to make sure that collective action works? Where would you really like us to see us raise the bar, put in more resources, uh, engage better more? Where would you advocate to put the attention around collective action as we move forward to make sure it does make that meaningful contribution to SDG 6? So if anyone wants to step up forward first, just unmute your mic and speak away. I can go ahead and take a first stab at that. It's a great question, Tom, and thank you for that. Um, two of the things that I think I've been focused on the most in order to, to scale up our um, co-investment strategies and with that, looking at projects that provide multiple benefits so that you can bring more investors that are interested in different things together on a project. Um, and I think a big piece of that is not only looking within the corporate water stewardship space, but looking at other funding sources. I mean, if you look at the investments that governments, for example, are making in water projects or water related projects, you know, the scale of those investments just hugely outweigh the scale of, of corporate investments right now. And so we need to be able to leverage both of those sources together. Um, and I know that the companies that we work with are, are really interested in that is how do they leverage the corporate funds that they can contribute to have greater impact. And I think that everyone likes to talk about, you know, co-investment strategies, but the some of the practicalities and the logistics of how do you actually bring those different sources of funding together um, really vary based on your locality. Um, and there's still a lot of the logistics to work out there. And so I would like to see uh, more work on those strategies and bringing in multiple investors with different interests and different benefits um, to scale up these multi-benefit projects. And I think that that's the only way that we're going to get to, you know, beyond these, you know, pilot scale initiatives that are really promising, but in the grand scheme of things are not making a big enough impact. So I will say that. And then I will just say, you know, one of the uh, important things about Quack to me, and one of the key elements of success that I didn't mention in my um, presentation is really this relationship aspect and the importance of building relationships and this, you know, trusted environment for collaboration. And Unfortunately, that's something that's difficult to scale up quickly, but I do think that it's a really important ingredient for collective action. Great, thank you, Cora. A great call to action, very clear. Uh, Nima, I saw you were unmuting. Do you wanna come in? Yeah, I think um, Cora put it really nice. I was just gonna say that, and um, just looking at, not looking at water as a standalone problem, right? So looking at the water climate nexus, right? I think that will take us a long way, right? And then I think I had someone else talk about, hey, the problems with water is long-term, right? And a lot of us living in North America, right? I think that's really true. We may not be facing pressing challenges right now, but it's long-term. So I think if we start now trying to build those collaborations and collective action, it will go a long way. And I think we also need to bring other other um, participants in collective action, right? So uh, like for example, um, water regulators, right? So municipalities, because I think there is sometimes, um, I don't want to call it conflict, but I, I think, you know, us wanting to reduce water sometimes can affect revenues for other entities, right? So we really need to figure out how do we make this a big, like create a bigger picture where at the end of the day, knowing that collective action can um, try to provide a more um, better watershed health and protect the water so resources that, let's say, for example, municipalities rely on to get water supply. And also long term, if we um, preserve the quality of the water, eventually it will reduce the, the investment that they have to make to, to, to clean the water and get it to their suppliers. So I think we need um, to bring more people on the table and not just organizations like us that, you know, want to mitigate water risk to make sure that there's enough supply long-term to, uh, to keep our business running. Fantastic, thank you, Nima. Yep. Um, Barry, Scott, Miguel, last chance for any last words with you around collective action? Any guidance, advice, expectations, or hopes? Um, um, oh, go Miguel, ahead. Mike. After you, and then then Scott. 
no, no, whatever. Okay, oh no, yeah, I'm thinking that the, um, the 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 same conversation that we two two points for me are really important. One, uh, we we talk a lot about regulation, but in some countries, regulation have other priorities. So we need to be clear with that. Is what it is a is a global challenge. In the company, we can we can put energy because it's a I think it's a must, right? We know that some country. Well, I did, I I I, I talked some example in Latin America where the water is a challenge but not a priority because the 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 focus of the governmental maybe is in other in other line. Uh, it's connected maybe with the water, but it's not so clear. So I just saw the opportunity of the of the water is is really important. Uh, and maybe the the company we have the responsibility for put this topic in like in the top. So. Um, the other about, about the expectation for me is it's like zero. I, like I say, I would like to, to use zero new water. And, and, and maybe for me, that is the focus. I remember when I, I, I heard a question about what happened 10 years ago. And my comparison could be like safety. I remember 15 years ago, the people talk about safety like nice to have, but right now it's a competitive point. So it's say that we have many injuries complicated in the business, in all business, but my expectation for that is could be faster. Uh, I think so we don't have a, more, a lot of time. So for me, several is possible in this, in this too. So that is a mixture about the comment before. So sorry for thank, that. Th thank you, Miguel. And Scott, over to you. I'd just say, uh, in, make sure you involve the suppliers in the, in the discussion and, and really um, collaborate with them. And also, to the you know brands and retailers, this is this is not a make a commitment for a year or two and you solve the problem. This is a long term. You have to get down in the weeds. You have to you know look at things like water meters and how much water is being used. And it's you know making the investment to actually follow through on the the commitments and and the guidance is is where I think is really critical. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I think we are just about at time so it remains for me to thank all of our speakers so Neha, Barry, Scott and Cora and also our panelists uh, Niime and Miguel and for all of those who posted the question I think we managed to get through all, all the questions that were posted on Pathable. Um, this was the second in a series of four sessions for Seminar 7. The remaining two sessions which will both be on the topic of corporate water stewardship tools and approaches um, will be on uh, Wednesday at uh, 2.30 uh, European time. This is particularly for audiences in the Americas and Europe. And then also on Thursday, uh, 7.30 European time, mainly for our Asian and Australian audiences. There'll be some overlap in speakers, but um, the topic will be corporate water stewardship tools and approaches. And it will be a super interactive session um, with breakouts, uh, et cetera. So thank you all for your participation. Much appreciated. Hope you've enjoyed the lively discussion. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and hope to connect with you again during the Water Week. So that's it for now. See you all again soon.